An independent film, of course, has nearly died in terms of there actually being a market for it. documentary a few years back and it was about the end of the video store era and the decline of physical media the last blockbuster video in the united states it opened up a can of worms that i think resonates throughout the history of film filmmaking is a freedom of speech issue and you have very few people who will buck that system the ambition is what matters at the heart is there and films have been censored throughout history in various ways that film which was his first film destroyed his career and controversy is really what makes a movie survive there was no streaming service that would even stream us. They just decided to start pulling content. We're not in control of our destinies, they are. All the rules that prevent monopoly and encourage competition have gone away. You should be able to, you should be able to turn a profit. You, you did. Someone stole it. <laughs> Somewhere along the 120 year plus history of film, people realized that movies had the ability to sculpt society in a way that was even more potent than the written word. And people have been trying to control it ever since. Benji Carvey here, live again inside the Warp Dimension. Hey, um, we're just coming here live to you. Well, a pre-recorded, uh, but Tom Seymour, Thomas Seymour, the director of VHS Master Two, has so gracious with us a presence here. He's an honored guest in the Warp Dimension because we have too many VHS to talk about, and so hope we'll get down to that a little bit. But say. Would say hello to Tom. Hey Tom, how's out? How you doing out there? Hey, it's great to be here. The the warp dimension. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. We just wanted to bring a place where the only thing that doesn't matter is time. Time does not matter here in the warp dimension. Excellent. But clearly all acronistic media, you know, from tapes to uh, my old recorder from back when I was a journalist. Uh, oh nice. <laughs> um to Stephen King books, and you can see all around us. I'll maybe I'll even give you a little tour because it's not just this part. There's a whole other second side to this as well. So yeah. uh, thank you again for joining us, Tom. And uh, let's uh, let's talk some let's talk some tape. So um, so first off, um, for those who uh, don't quite know uh, that this is a sequel to yeah. your documentary VHS Massacre, um, and kind of dive us into a little bit how the VHS Massacre came about. <laughs> Oh, how the, yeah. Um, well, the first one came about because um, the, the video store was video store era was ending sort of rapidly in front of my eyes. Um, you know, it, it had sort of been in decline, but some some major things were happening where um, the blockbuster as a, a corporate entity was was uh, disappearing, and then some beloved New York video stores like Kim's Video. Um, uh, one under as well as uh, some um, other video stores within um, Astoria and Queens and things like that. And so um, it, it was odd because like it, that, that era was so beloved to me and we started making this documentary and we, we it, it was, um, it was sort of great for the documentary and it's just overall incredibly depressing for, uh, you know, me as a filmmaker. Um, so, uh, and you know, when we started the doc, like, my one one of my films was coming out, Mark of the Beast, and it was in Kim's video. We had, we didn't know it was gonna go under like within a year, you know. So, um, so that's what that one was about, and it was about really about about um, it had some nostalgia for the video store area, but it 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 tuned into the fact that independent filmmakers really made their money off of the physical media, because streaming at that time made no money for independent films, and so. And then the sequel, VHS Massacre 2, really looks upon the unfair treatment of um, independent films and exploitation films in regard to the major media uh, companies. 
Um, because of media consolidation, a lot of those films have totally lost the ability to recover budgets. And over, over time, society absolutely loses out because you don't know how those smaller films affect uh, society down the road 20 years, you know. Um, so that's kind of what the, the, the second one was about. Yeah, because I think the bridge, um, kind of re rewinding a little bit here, mm -hmm. uh, sorry for the puns that <laughs> exists in the warp dimension, uh, is that kind of, I rewatched uh, VHS Massacre 1 again this past week to, because uh, I saw two and I was like, oh, it's been about a couple years since I've seen the first mm -hmm. one, let's go back. First one I feel like is very much your journey um, through that. And then the second one is where the bridge is, it sort of ends on this more of this hopeful thing about streaming because Joe Bob kind of ends on in the first one about, oh yeah, streaming, streaming's great. It's better than pirating. And then, um, and he used, and you actually used a lot of this, you interviewed Joe Bob, I don't know for how long, because he used a lot of the footage that was new in two as yeah. well, that was from the same era. And Joe Bob kind of had this whole transformation between, you know, the first two as well. But the, the whole um, bridge that it is, is that then there's this question of streaming now, which net neutrality and, Amazon and like disappearing because that's the that was the big shocker everyone forgot about copyright so kind of and as Tom Demicho said it's kind of an answer to what happened with one but um kind of getting into it a little bit um with uh with just sort of rights like is this sort of like I feel like this this part two definitely teaches a lot of young filmmakers now about the new era of how do you get your movie shown but also the big question of how do you get your money so do you kind of want to maybe teach us a little bit how how do you kind of guided yourself on that <laughs> well yeah i mean it definitely was an investigation into to, to who is actually making it work you know um and and it's really difficult um there are people who um, lloyd talk lloyd coffin talks about um the people who are sort of uh making a living off of filmmaking it's usually through this kind of brand building um like he mentions the cinema snob where it's like he's got a he, he probably has merchandise, but he's got a, a podcast. This podcast seems to be profitable and he's made two features. So he, he's a person who can um, sort of support himself through through that type of filmmaking. Um, Angry Video Game Nerd is a, a you know, smash hit, like sort of uh, internet personality. And I don't imagine he makes a ton of money off of his films, but the, the sort of overall package of um, brand building and content making, you can people can make a go of it. Um, it, it is really hard. Um, then there's, a, I don't really talk about this in the film, but like you can absolutely make a living in the, the film and television industry. You're just usually working in house for, you know, you're usually burning your creative, you know, energy to create content for other people, you know. <laughs> you are living in it right now. <laughs> I, mentioned, I mean, when I, when I was just reflecting on that so much, I mean, I think something that I think we all have, and especially I'm in that weird sort of like older millennial, but yet, you know, you know, just past. So it's like weird, like I, I'm at the younger age, but I remember Gen X and all those things. But is that uh, it's just sort of, yeah, the content of branding. And I think we, I think all of us, and especially, you know, wanted to start, you know, now in this new era, wanted to start making movies first and then kind of found ourselves now in oh we can make movies on our phone you know and things like that like or angry angry video game nerd being like oh i'm gonna market myself this way and that's gonna build me into now i can make my feature whether or not i make money because there, is there any money to be made in features is the big question anymore i mean not, yeah. yeah debt keeps expanding you know things like that it, it it's um it is really tough for exploitation films um the the major media companies or the new players like Amazon and Netflix, like they, Netflix was built on the back of, of low budget filmmakers. And they, once they got big enough, they just, um, they no longer acquired, you know, micro budgets and stuff like that. And, and then Amazon and what was it? 2018 deleted thousands of, of films off of uh, their service for some bullshit. Uh, I can swear, right? Swearing's okay. Oh fuck yeah! So, okay, uh, and so, it doesn't yeah. matter. Time, okay. time doesn't okay. matter. <laughs> you can yeah, they, the warp dimension all you want. So, oh, yeah. uh, cool. Yeah, so they had this a bunch of horse shit about uh, uh, quality standards, but um, none of it was true because you couldn't. Uh, if you had a, if you wanted to remaster your film and, and re-upload it, they had 
they had like barred it, barred you from doing that. So um, they just, um, I think, you know, you were talking about marketing, the, the market's totally split. Uh, like, so, you know, if someone's marketing a $200 million movie, they're spending $200 million in advertising. And uh, because it's so splintered, you know, um, they're doing web, they're doing TV, they're doing all this stuff. So I think that tendency has really um, caused them to, to really uh, take control over the whole industry. So people on YouTube get treated less and less fair every year. People on Prime, you know, it just go down the list, you know. So that's a big question too, is also uh, how much is people making off, not just movies, but you know, with Spotify, getting your listens, getting, you know, marketed that way as well. Um, I mean, if you were on Netflix, per, well, original, which means produced in-house or out-house. Yep. Out um, th there's the big question, no one knows. No one knew. They're kind of now revealing a little bit, oh, how much views or what was big. They have the, the one through 10 scale, what's popular, which again, who's picking and choosing that as well is the, yeah. is the big question. So I think it, the part two really answers a lot about what's about going on behind the curtain kind of thing more um then the first one's more about like because i also wanted to get it's interesting like i was kind of seeing if you were going to talk about mark of the beast in two at all because oh. <laughs> of your journey with that in the first one you were kind of similar with um his name escapes right now but with the new era filmmaker um his sort of his thing of like oh trying to you know i got i got distribution but then in the end i didn't get anything and now and then now with streaming too it's like filmmakers are like I'm not seeing anything like residuals, even, you know, TV, like reruns and whatnot. So yeah. hold on one second. Yeah, sure. It's funny, as, as you brand yourself out more, you get more spam on your phone. <laughs> so oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> that's the crazy thing about this is like marketing. This has been a lot of fun, but at the same time, it's like my phone has been blowing up with most rando stuff or my iCloud has been compromised phone calls. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm pretty sure my, my club's fine. There's nothing really on there. So, um, yeah, sorry about Gmail's that. has been acting up, but, um, yeah, I mean, I could talk about Mark of the Beast a little bit. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to kind of get to know a little bit more because that, that was the, um, where is that at now streaming? Are you experiencing something similar? Like, um, yeah, I mean that, that movie made no money. <laughs> that movie, uh, yeah. That was um, that was one of the last films I made with uh, John Gorman, who's a dear friend of mine. Um, and that I think that was about a six thousand dollar feature. Like that's how much cash we had. Um, everyone volunteered on it, except for um, a few people were cast, like Ellen Muth and Debbie Roshan. Um, uh, and we we didn't even make back the six grand, you know. Um, and, and I spent you know, a year and a half editing it and putting it out. Like it, it won, it won um, a Platinum Remy at World Fest Houston and it, it won some festivals and stuff. But um, the idea that you could make a horror film, a sort of horror exorcism film um, and not recover six grand is kind of sad. Um, it was distributed through MVD, which is a, they're like a, a wonderful distribution company that has has helped um, independent uh, filmmakers for years and years. So I, I would recommend them. But um, you know, it's just really it's really hard to be uh, found in in the sort of ocean of of content. Yeah, uh, we we've been featuring also more uh, trauma film artists. We had last you know last night the feature filmmakers to be reckoned with, and. Um, Something that's interesting is I uh, Troma was able to uh, put up one of my shorts uh, online in 2016, 2017, around there. Uh, but I kept telling people like, don't like, we'll get marketing a little bit, but don't like expect like anything bigger than just <laughs> hey, we got our name out there and and it was cool. It got added onto like an anthology, but it was Excellent. like, still, but still to this day, I mean, it it was the cheapest short I ever made because I definitely have one where I spent about as much as you did and more on a short that definitely got the festival runs, but I was really hoping to get it as a feature, still working as getting mm. it as a feature, but spending my money. And then, and then like the content I knew was definitely going to get, it's, it was exploit, it was grindhouse exploitation, but with a little hard hitting shot on the border and uh, definitely got a lot of feedback saying, this looks great, maybe a little dark, maybe a shot, not enough lighting. 
it's low budget, but uh, you have certain content that no one wants to touch on, you know, which is of course at the time yeah. this is for me too, sexual assault. And so, okay, yeah. And so, um, and, and yeah, and I was like, well, I made the movie because I wanted to make it, you know, the way we wanted to make it. Um, and, but at the same time, that was the risk we kind of take, we took from that. And yeah. So, and, that, and that's, that's the risk that exploitation filmmakers make. And, and a lot of the stuff is, um, that, that's what it's all about. It's pushing boundaries of taste, um, and doing stuff that the studios are too cowardly to do or doing things that, um, they just don't think that particular niche will make money. Um, so I think, so I think exploitation overall as a movement is in, in incredibly important. And, and I, I definitely lean towards um, as little interference and in censorship as, as possible in regard to films because they're fucking stories, you know? They're, they're fucking stories. We're making movies, we're making narratives. Uh, you know, it, it should be, there should be given a, a pretty large leeway for uh, fiction, you know? That's the way I feel about it. Because that was uh, leading into the Debbie Rashawn story about with her yeah. with, uh, model shop and, and stuff like that. And so... Well, yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, uh, model model hunger, yeah. Model um, hunger, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of movies percolating in the warp dimension here. So uh, <laughs> Model shop, that's a good title. I don't know if that's taken. I like it. <laughs> that sounds like a very exploitation title that Joe Bob would do a commentary on. <laughs> right. <laughs> Start your engines, folks. <laughs> Oh, um, but yeah, with, um, with that, yeah, with Model Hunger, um, I just, yeah, I, I identified a lot with that. It's, it's interesting to see that because I'm very appreciative of places like Wild Eye, um, that yeah. do put stuff out there. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just this whole thing of being seen is the big question. I mean, and in the end also, I think Lloyd, what I love about it, and he's been really, have you seen the last Blockbuster documentary too at all? I, I didn't see it, but I have a crazy story about that, yeah. but. Um, but go, go on, go on, because I'll tell the story after. So you, you also have it in, in VHS Massacre 2, the, the returning of the tape and all that. But the thing is, I, what I love about Lloyd, every time someone asks him about Blockbuster from your documentary to others, he's like, fuck them. Fuck those <laughs> yeah. motherfuckers. I couldn't get a movie in there. So in the end, it's this weird irony of like, it still was the struggle back then. It's still even more of a struggle now. I mean, they got YouTube, just try to get them, uh, get out of them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, actually... Um, Weirdly enough, I checked to see if Mars Short was still up there. That was one of the ones that got lost in the, when the oh. YouTube got taken down. So, um, which I understood, but it was a couple of years ago. But it was just sort of like I was. What was like, the name oh. of that? What was the name of that short? So the short was called "Life Is Cheap." Oh, okay, um, cool. Yeah, great title. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it your way. Uh, it, it's uh, it, uh, but the cool thing about it is, is that it just got on an anthology called Dark Tales. Great so in England. Uh, it does a lot of the grand exploitation anthology he does that so he, he added that on and i think it just i think it's on prime now and dvd out excellent here. so um sorry <laughs> i know no, no. i relate um, to the story that most people and then additional to kind of moving back to when we were screening it yeah uh, last night i go all over the place in the warp dimension so we'll tie it up no, and, so good. and we'll shout back and then mr hall will shout back from you know from beyond <laughs> um so Something that um, our tech programmer and producer Ro uh, Romani mentioned uh, and people were asking about it was, does another hole in the head should they do their own streaming site because they've been around for almost 20 years? Yeah, and that's a good idea. Um, uh, you know what I was thinking of, uh, just thinking about is, I, I mentioned that company MVD. MVD teamed up with Rue Morgue to mm -hmm. start, uh, Min I think it's called Midnight Movie Society. And so um, that's a things like that give me hope. I don't know how well they're doing, but you take a really good brand like Rue Morgue and you hook it up with a, a very reliable and in, entrenched independent distributor, MVD, and you, and you make, they basically have their own Roku channel. And I'm like, that stuff gives me hope. And Troma now gives me hope um, as a subscription service, because that's where it's all going. And, and, and so you just got to cross your fingers and hope one of those goes, you know? I think it's Ben Bagdickian, one of the, the great mass communications professors, talked about how we're all going into these niches as, as society moves into the streaming even further. Um, and yeah, doing a PowerPoint presentation when Hulu first dropped like 10 years ago in a NASCOM class, I remember. And like, yeah, like 
well and it's interesting with the pandemic where do the theaters go you know and yeah. we're at the drive-in though which is cool but at the same time we're doing this the streaming is really then and we're creating even more fully more on niches and stuff like that which yeah i feel like it's a positive it's a weirder thing though getting into the humanity of it all because <laughs> you know it's you're you know that that is a big question i think we all have about like well we're engaging but yet we're not engaging you know kind of thing it's like that. true and and i i find myself moving further and further into the the sort of niche of of genre film uh the sort of vhs era um new content that comes out but within those um within that realm um and then you start to like we were talking about we probably have a, like 50 different crossovers of connections if we really dug into it you know mm -hmm. because the you know the the horror scene tends to be uh smaller than you think you know um yeah so i'm, I'm definitely sort of guilty of 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 sort of deep diving into that that sort of uh horror community because the other thing too is like you know after trying to make movies for i don't know 25 years like you you try to go after what works if you find one thing that works like like especially someone like me who cannot spend that much money on a film like i'm gonna try to keep, i'm gonna try to um you know build on that so you know that's that's another thing too about these vhs massacre docs is like i love this stuff i really love it and i can make these docs for for cheap um i don't have to spend you know 10 grand to make one you know so that's uh it helps me keep going because it's something i would be doing anyway it's a a lot of filmmakers like you or i that's a compulsion like we we would be doing it anyway you know yeah i mean it's interesting it's like this is the first year i've gone without shooting a short film or trying to get a production going officially in some sort of version of pre-production because of this but then like literally mr wholehead's warped dimension is like no this is a production like this is all my art art department <laughs> experience <laughs> like really it's like okay this is the production that i'm gonna be on um, yeah. but at the same time though yeah like it's where do we draw our line our own personal line you know some people say like oh well you're just being obnoxious selling out trying to brand yourself but other times you're like hey this is the only way i'm gonna actually maybe get you know be able to keep going with this i mean how how another hole in head started was uh uh you know was george's dream baby back in like the, in, in 2000 kind of like in, in the early 2000s and just sort of being a festival promoter himself and then, yeah, he, he took a big risk. He always says, you know, oh, I spent, I lost a lot of money the first year. But then he was able to build that up. And, you know, there's definitely been, you know, some amazing moments here. And then now we're in this new era. Uh, again, no pun intended to, <laughs> <laughs> to, to that. And then sort of like, okay, so now it's Mr. Hole's Warped Dimension, things like that. You know, how do we bridge this, but also keep another hole in the head, also its own thing. Mm -hmm. So it's- yeah, it, I, yeah. Oh, you know what I wanted to say? Okay, so the yeah, last sorry. blockbuster. <laughs> yeah. Um, the last last blockbuster. Um, so um, Tom Poyer, who uh, he shot the last blockbuster, blockbuster. Sorry, last blockbuster segments for VHS Massacre Two. Um, he he approached that last blockbuster and they said, you know, we're we're currently uh, engaged to make a documentary, and that was the last blockbuster doc. And, um, and so I, t I talked to that producer. I said, look, we, I only need like five minutes of, I, I was like, I'll sign something that says like, oh, we're only going to use five minutes of edited footage. You know, like we're not, we don't need that much. And we started talking. I talked to him about the first movie. He's like, can you get me a Lloyd Kaufman uh, interview? I was like, I, I can try. And so, you know, I was like, Lloyd, do you want to <laughs> talk with this? person and and uh he's like yeah okay and so um he so the guy did the interview and he said exactly what you said like he was he goes wow lloyd really doesn't like blockbuster <laughs> um yeah. and then uh so then we shot our footage but that's how we got permission to to shoot our stuff oh, yeah because i know that they were working particularly with the manager of that documentary yeah it's kind of a highlight of her life which i think is what makes that very special and unique compared to just being like, oh, the nostalgia of the video era. And I, 
that one actually needs like an immediate sequel because I know that they've been doing Airbnbs at that point. <laughs> no, I know. Yeah, <laughs> so I would do like, that. <laughs> kind of what I, I kind of was also saying is that now with, you know, with COVID yeah. and times and stuff like that, is that do you see a need also just uh, a VHS Massacre 3 to finish the trilogy out kind of thing? Um, Cause it feels like that and then now and here we are now. Like, I mean, I'd say, you know, probably another year and then you would have an entire, you know, entire third documentary. <laughs> well, I, I definitely have been thinking about it and um, I, I, like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can see more enough information in, in um, coming up. Um, but yeah, I think, I think I wait a little, little bit longer to sort of see how the, how the landscape plays out. But um, I did think, here's the thing, no one asked for VHS Massacre 2. Uh, like trauma, like it, the first one did really well for trauma. It did, it got on movie and a couple other things I never expected, but L Lloyd wasn't like, I really want a VHS massacre too. It's just that, um, I, there was a lot of really screwed up things happening. And I, I just, I felt compelled to, 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 um, to dig in and do it. And I really wanted to, and I was thinking that I was like, this is a sequel. I don't know how many people saw the first one. And uh, so when I did the film festival circuit, I went kind of nuts. I think I entered 40 or 50 film, film festivals. And, um, and in result, like it's, it's actually done. I think it's pl played in 24 festivals. It's won 15 awards. And so I can actually see maybe doing like a part three. Um, but when I entered, I was like, who the hell is going to play a sequel to an obscure doc? So anyway, Thank you for playing my movie. <laughs> you know, I, I was so excited when um, I, I approached Trauma about the festival. And I was like, hey, uh, we interviewed Lloyd for, uh, for my podcast earlier this summer. And I was like, uh, we're, uh, you know, I'm with another hole in the head. We don't know what's going to happen yet with that festival. And then, um, and then we started doing these free weekend nights on Zoom. And we're like, hey, let's make something out of it. And I was like, you know what? Like, let me hit up Lloyd and Tom. And they're like, yeah, like definitely like, like we have, you know, I was thinking, oh, we'll probably get Shakespeare shitstorm. But in the end, I was like, no, we actually have uh, like the slashing, Newton Blast. Newton Blast is the one I'm just so excited for people to see. I on. need to see that. I still have not seen that, but I got to, I'm dying to see that one. It's just, it's like that, that, that golden, like there's always that one movie that comes along every five or six years from Troma. Yes. That really. That, that that's the one that's just sort of like and it's a foreign film too so it it might you know touch and go uh i interviewed fernando a couple days ago um uh you know and we have a pre-record with him and yeah he's he definitely talks about like yeah you know english portuguese you know things like that that was definitely a a thing but then uh but yeah it's i feel like it was not to reveal too much but yeah i felt like i was like this is like the Tromeo and Juliet, the, you know, it's like, there's always Cannibal the Musical. This is the one that 10 years from now, people are gonna be like, oh yeah, that's a Tromeo movie. <laughs> you know, yeah. kind of like that. But they, I, I feel like very passionate about that one. Uh, Father's Day, I think is the last one I could think of that really like, was like. Yeah, Ooh. Father's Day, man. Yeah, that's Astron 6, I think. Those guys yeah. are awesome, yeah. man. Yeah, those, the, and the journey of them too. I mean, that'd be great to see if you could talk to them for VHS Massacre 3 or something like that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, the t did you ever see The Taint? The Taint, I thought was... Um, I have not seen The Taint, and I have not seen The Editor. Oh, um, yes. the et Yeah, yeah. The Editor is supposed to be great. Um, I came about with Astro Institute in an odd way. Um, I used to hang out at the Cine Family quite a bit back in LA, and that's how I kind of got it more into, you know, niche genre grindhouse, you know, besides just watching Joe Bob and Elvira. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, and they showed Manborg there. Yeah, yeah, Manborg. I saw that. And uh, yeah. I was like, okay, like this is special. I don't know what to think of it. But then, um, and I also, uh, when I lived in LA, I, I worked for Amoeba Records. I was part oh, of the, excellent. I was, the, I was one of the, they passed the torch for me for a couple of years in the cult section. So I got to yeah, curate. Man. And I found their shorts that they did. And Cool Guys, I don't know if you've seen that one. Um, no, I never, I never saw that one. Highly recommend that one because that's like the perfect, it makes fun of 80s sex teen comedy. So they're going to the beach, but then all of a sudden it like has a twist where, you know, they got to, you know, hide the body and everyone's all coked out and, and screaming and it's the exorcist all of a sudden, you know, things like that. So 
Uh, those guys are Canadian, right? I think they are. Yeah. So I hope, like, I hope to God those guys are making money because, could, I mean, that's like an example. If those guys can't make money, that's really messed up because, like, they're the stuff they put out is excellent. And it's like a tragedy if they're not able to keep going, you know? They work in a different market, though. They're Canadian also. So there's always that. I mean, that's the weird thing of uh, being the States is we're in a capitalist society. Lloyd talks about this, you know, with the, the laws that were changed and, you know, and back and forth, you know, and I think filmmaking is definitely this, we want to make this communal social world, but at the same time, we only survive off of capitalism at the yeah. end of the day. And so it's that melding of those worlds in Canada, which is why they have David Cronenberg, and, you know, uh, and yeah. Fantasia, Asia, of course, you know, all the great artists that are coming out of there, filmmakers, Toronto After Dark, you know, the list goes on. Um, I think it's also because of, you know, government influence. Yeah. I mean, they, they will bankroll a film. Uh, they used to bankroll almost anything. And then I think they're, um, I think they legislated requirements to take independent content. Yeah. So I think, I think that's, no, I, I, I think you're right. I think um, that's probably why they have a, a really like burgeoning um, exploitation film scene, you know. But, and then uh, there's the flip side that Fernando talked about in Mutant and Blast is that uh, Portugal being such a small film community, Mutant and Blast got money because that judge, those judges of the government that year were into genre, but then his next, his next film got rejected. He can reapply. But they should be like, if you're in a smaller, you know, a smaller film, you know, film community or film state, government is, it shouldn't just be going to all, well, we just like these movies, even though it's like, well, there should be 25% to dramas, 25% to genre, horror, you know, not yeah. just, oh yeah, well, the people we picked this year, they like this, you know, kind of thing. It's more of, I think Canada definitely is partial that excellently off. Yeah, so. yeah in the United States, um, because I've taken grant writing classes and all this stuff like the they like it's pretty much just like um it has to be some kind of important social justice documentary or something like it really like good luck trying to fund a horror film in the United States through grants you know it's never gonna happen um so we're they're really picky about what they approve you know yeah, it's the irony of Bong Jung Ho being like, "Oh, he wins for Parasite. Who where has this guy been?" It's like he's been doing the same movie, the same yeah. cross genre stuff in you know South Korea and here in the states. So yeah, here, uh, oh, yeah, or like the, it's a big surprise that South Korea makes excellent films. Like they no, they've they've made excellent films for a long time. Um, was it Castaway on the Moon? Is like one of my favorite films ever. Like, yeah, I mean well, the uh, Kim Duk Kai films, which definitely are more art house you know drama pieces but if you've seen like address unknown or spring summer fall spring or winter spring uh man, like on the surface you're like oh pretentious art house film from you know from you know and you're like but you get in and you're like no these movies are excellent very yeah, much yeah. like um and i mean he's been a, such a huge influence on my work i mean pitra and uh what's the other one that just came out where it's all the castrations <laughs> um well, i don't know Mobius, Mumbia. Uh, it was a few years back, but uh, they came out signed and said, those ones were more like, okay, now he's trying to, you know, he's even amping up the genre stuff more um, gotcha. from there. But yeah, definitely check out Kim Dakai films. Uh, hmm. I always feel like he's sort of in the history behind his work too. Like he, he left at one point because uh, an actress actually was hung, like got hung in, you know, and he was like, I can't do this. He made a documentary about it, not doing movies anymore. And then he came back a few years later. Oh, wow. Um, that's crazy so yeah look him up um but uh but yeah i i, I really kind of what i love though getting back to vhs massacre 2 and so like, is is yeah you can create these you know kind of you know what might be at first feel like are these nostalgia pieces like no like they actually get into like this is what i would show in a cinema class to be like to filmmakers kind of like that say hey this is again pitfalls of the industry or the positives you know just so you know or if you're just watching the office uh, on on binge watching The Office again, just remember you know where the John Krasi that John Krasinski story you know kind of yeah out. yeah like he came he actually came from the independent film scene although like immediately distanced himself from any independent content as soon as he got The Office and his directorial well not his directorial debut he did uh, I think uh, interviews with Hideous Men or something like that it was like yeah. a feature. 
But A Quiet Place One is is a it's it's a genre That's in a the horror film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he he his interviews, even in his interviews, he's like, oh, I don't. I told them I don't do genre films, and then I decide to rewrite the whole thing with my wife and blah blah blah. So it's like I, you know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I actually think Emily Blunt is the reason why he did that because I think because she loves genre stuff because you watch Looper, you watch, you know, like she's involved with some, and then uh, Edge of Tomorrow. Oh, these movies are yeah. very much like would have been a Roger Corman film 30 years ago, but now they have like, you know, they have, you know, great filmmakers like Ryan Johnson and, and uh, which one, Doug Lyman and all that, and, and Christopher Query. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just like, it's like, I think she's the one who really was like, no, 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 John, think about it. Probably, yeah. That we're going to make money off of. And yeah, exactly. make a good movie yeah. from it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I Edge of Tomorrow is like a like fantastic genre yeah. film, you know? I really, I really hope they make that sequel, too. I think yeah. that's one I've been uh, looking forward to. But I, I think, yeah, I think, because um, I was very resistant to The Quiet Place when I when I first heard about it. Oh, I don't make this, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Not like, Okay, like, what, what? also, can we talk about this a little bit? And this is something maybe I might bite my own tongue at some point. What is up with all these new generation filmmakers who are in the, in, in the mainstream? Are they being told not to say, oh, I don't like, I'm not a horror filmmaker? Kind of thing, because I've heard that so much lately. Yeah, it's, it's really weird. I, I, I was, you know, one day I was looking up, um, this is a fun thing to do, look up any horror film and see what it comes up for genre. And they almost always will, it will not say horror. It will almost always say something weird like thriller, mystery, you know, some combination of, um, you know, murder, mystery, you know. And for years, I mean, like horror was kind of like this embarrassing thing. Um, and so that that is kind of a long legacy of, of studio films is to even, even the most famous, fucking horror movies like the exorcist will call itself like some kind of like thriller mystery or something so i i part of me thinks it's just you know douchebaggery of just you know mainstream horror stars just pretending that they're not doing genre i, I don't know that's the only thing i can think of you know? i think you know uh not to name names you know and some of these you know some of these people are also yeah, I, I would just say yeah they're great filmmakers these are great movies that are coming out they will definitely stand the test of time kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, and, but at the same time though, yeah, there's a lot of that, you know, I think Mick Garrison mentions like, yeah, just like this whole thing of the horror genre, like being a dirty word or, you know, sci-fi, you know, you have to be, yeah, a psychological drama, you know, a thriller and like <laughs> yeah. that. When, like Seven is a straight up, and I think Fincher would not be someone who would, uh, I think, just to say, I think he knows what he's doing exactly. Like he knows mm-hmm. that he's loving it. Uh, but he's got to fight every tooth and inch of it, <laughs> you know, kind of thing like that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, like, Seven's a, if you want to call, it's almost like a giallo, right? I mean, it's a fucking horror movie with, <laughs> with a detective story, you know? Like, it's, you know, um, brilliant, you know? But yeah, it, it's weird. You know, it could be also the way that the studios want to market it. They They may be literally told not to refer to things as horror, you know? Um, I'm sure there's a lot of control like that over what they can talk about, you know? I was really happy because I was, I know people talk about, you know, of course, Jordan Peele's name brought up around this, but it is that I, I think Get Out's a great film. Is it, you know, and the script is, yeah, definitely stronger probably than, than Us. But what I really appreciated about Us was that it was a horror film through and through. It was not a horror comedy you know, there's, it was, and I was just like, cool, like, he's wanting to make, you know, horror films, he's wanting to make thrill, you know, these, like, and they're bloody, and they're creepy, whether you like them a lot, or, you know, it's kind of hard to come into that second film, but it's just like, that gets me excited when I see someone like that, being like, no, I'm sticking to this side, not like, let's bridge this over here, kind of like that, or I'm gonna go more loose, kind of thing, so. Well, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, that's Jordan Peele, right? Obviously, uh, he he's a uh, yeah, like he's a real horror fan. Like he, you know, you, you look at. I think he's doing something with the Candyman now. Yeah, he produced and it. In the more you you hear him in interviews, and the more he talks, like, oh no, he's one of us. He's a he's a very cool 
dude that like loves horror and knows you know everything about um the genre and so like he like that you know blumhouse and all that stuff i think that's you know a lot of that stuff's great um him and his stuff in particular and um like better him than like someone who doesn't give a shit about horror you know well and i think also another name i'll, I'll throw out there chris landon's work um has been uh i think uh apparently Activity, the mark ones is the best one in the series next to uh, i i don't know if you've seen that that one uh what was it? Ones. the mark ones though the one-off paranormal activity movie that was the skater kids oh no i didn't see it i didn't see it oh it's a good one yeah it's like that one to me is a fun one because um it could have almost been like kids in, on their tapes and stuff, their, their skate tapes. Mm -hmm. And so, but that, that to me was like, oh, this is great. Um, what the genre can do, you know, cause also, and then you get into the niche of found footage and stuff like that, which I'm, I'm a big fan in bites of it. I think it works as a great short format as a feature. Mm -hmm. It gets, you know, you kind of have to do things. I don't know how you feel about found footage <laughs> on it. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I think we were all worn out by it a bit, but, uh, when it's done right, it's like, it's amazing. Like, um, I, you know, I watched Cannibal Holocaust again recently. I'm yeah. like, that movie's fucked up, but it's super well done. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, found footage can be really powerful stuff, you know. Cause I want to do a uh, kind of segue because I feel like that's the meld found footage to VHS in a lot of ways of like, oh, oh we sure. tapes. Um, I um so I have a I have a little collection back here. This is not the whole collection. Um, actually, a lot of them are here next to me, uh, on the on the on the ground. But I found uh, I go VHS hunting every once in a while, especially in COVID is very interesting times. Um, and we're also going to be doing a VHS nights uh, oh, starting nice. October in Warped Dimension. But I found this tape. If you can read, if you can see what it says, <laughs> a sign from God. Awesome. <laughs> and if you uh, and you notice that. Uh, you can't really see in the reflector of the light a little bit, but there are crosses. One's upside uh, down, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think they were intentionally. <laughs> um, so, and it's uh, inside this tape, but yes, a sign from God uh, is the tape that I have here. We'll uh, try to angle that up so it's not so bright, but yeah, a sign from God. Yeah. And, um, but it's crazy is that this tape, so I, I was like, I got to get this. So I got this for a dollar. Reminds me of also Grandpa's toys from yeah, <laughs> Grandpa's magic um, and, toys. And it's something here that's I think really special is that it is, it is um, someone put it on um, on LP mode. So it's uh, so there's like little weird tapes at the very end that's just mostly like news news broadcastings from like Fox News back in like two uh, nine late nineties early two thousands. Oh, that's funny. But the the tape a sign from God is it was a special that uh fox put on in the summer of 99 that they claimed to be live and it was live like we're reporting here uh with so and so it was like total fox news how they do it now like uh, fox and friends kind of stuff but they're like oh we have a uh, live from davis we have a biologist here that is indenting this picture that is the blood of christ is supposedly is bleeding from and now <laughs> we're going to go to the vatican and now we're going to go to brazil and stuff like that but it's a two-hour special that was made just for stigmata coming out because that was a fox film oh wow and so these commercials that are played throughout this two-hour special is very specifically uh bay area <laughs> summer of 99 and what that means is that not only do we get like news clips of like of truck commercials and coming up on the k uh k and tv uh fox new two news which i grew up on with dennis richmond um quite a bit and they always have the best one because they have, have you ever seen their intro they just it's so dramatic kind of like that um but the thing is is that there are trailers for not just stigmata but for a week it was somehow it was broadcast when it was recorded was broadcast a week before the blur witch project came out so there's a trailer yeah. that is like the movie that everyone's talking about is it real is it not you know, <laughs> like it, it, you will finally see for yourself this Friday and stuff like that. And then later on, we get the Sixth Sense where it's like special sneak preview. This is before Sixth Sense was anything. Oh, wow. And, and you're just like, I don't know. I just, this tape blows my mind. So, yeah, that's that's a good, like, yeah, that's a, like, um, a good segment of history there. That was, that's an exciting, 
all yeah. that stuff piled into one. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't even think about that. All that stuff happened at the same time. That's crazy, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, there's other trailers too that are in here, but yeah, um, and, and stuff going on. But so I'm, I'm actually cutting in pieces the commercials and with the segment and stuff like that, so. I, 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 but you know, when I find tapes and there's commercials on them, like that, a lot of the times that's like the most fascinating thing because it's like a, it's sort of a hot dough. It's sort of like the Marshall McLuhan theory. He thought, he thought actually people who made commercials were more in touch with the audience than the people who made the TV shows because it was like a, a hot dose. They had to, it, it wasn't just watched, you know, trying to get you to like a TV show. It was like, trying to get you to buy a product in 30 seconds you know and so when you look at some of those old commercials from the 80s and 90s that you find on vhs tapes some are so weird and you're like i don't i don't actually understand what the the reference is here you know um so that stuff's gold when you find that on a tape like someone taped a movie off the tv i love that stuff i'll watch all the commercials you know the, the commercials are the gold also something so I'm going to play a little thing here with you. Since you worked at a video store back in the day, uh, what was the video store again? Uh, that uh, fun stuff video. And then actually I did work for Blockbuster for like a year and a half. Yeah. Before, before I worked for fun stuff video. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's funny uh, uh, getting into just a brief mention is that one thing about the last Blockbuster documentary mentions, and I think that is very key is that that Blockbuster was always been a mom and pop. It just got bought out by Blockbuster. So I think that's a very key thing. And I was going to wonder, like, was that, was, was like, so you went to Blockbuster first, then fun stuff after that? Yeah, I was my, you know, so my brother and my cousin started opening these video stores and first they had one and then they got up to like 20 at some point all, all collectively. But for the longest time, it was, it was only a couple stores and they would work there full time. So they wouldn't have any, uh, uh, hours. And I was in high school working at like terrible fast food jobs at like Wendy's or whatever. So like when I could work at Blockbuster, I was like, this is amazing. I'm not covered in grease, you know, like it was, uh, so I, I actually have really fond memories of Blockbuster. It just, it just in hindsight, you can look at how much damage the, the corporate entity did, but yeah, like the, the last blockbuster and Ben, that's like a family business now. So, you know, you can't really have any bad will towards them, you know? Yeah. I think it's just the interesting irony. I think uh, in places like if you go to Los Angeles still, um, see, that's what I'm trying to like stack up. So uh, what we can talk about on the, on the search of war video stores are still alive because it's like, everyone thinks black blockbuster is like, this is the last video store period. And it's like, no, like you go to video tech in South Pasadena, you go to cinephile in Santa Monica you go to, um, you know, there's other little niche places around the area. Um, Florida's got one. I think it might be called Grindhouse. Florida's got a pretty um, profitable video store down there in Tampa, I think. Texas has a lot. I know Austin just closed Love Video, I believe. Um, I, I'm, I, I don't know much about Austin. I'm still trying to develop my Austin understanding. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, Portland, Matt, Mike's Matt, uh, Movie Madness, Matt Mike's Movie Madness just became... Uh, which is really cool. It's a file, um, for, uh, 501 nonprofit now with Hollywood Theater. So uh, Dan Halstead, who runs that over there, excellent guy. And now they're doing 36 Cinemas, which oh, is with wow. Rita doing commentary like this and stuff like that. So there's this amazing thing that, that is core there is it's, if it's run by a couple people, you know, it's fine. But when you get that bigger generation, it's, it's weird. So leading into that, I was a shift lead at a Holly video for about a year and a half. Excellent. So, um, which we always pride ourselves on a few things. And um, is one, our classic collection, you know, not the wall, but the, the core uh, was better. We had a better selection um, of than Blockbuster. Blockbuster didn't care about the, you know, the movies over time. No, they didn't. Uh, and it was true. Um, our best selling uh, DVD was wire the wire season four <laughs> so um it's just watching your movie and doing the commentary with everyone last night got me thinking it's like should i just write this book you know yeah but, you should <laughs> but it's funny because it's hollywood i never worked for blockbuster i interviewed for blockbuster once when i was in film school in portland for a summer and i remember they told me i had to sell them something and i was like all i had in my hand was like a tack 
and I tried to, and I think I, I actually cursed. <laughs> I was like, you don't want, you want like a good tag. You want some broke ass tag. <laughs> so, like that. And they're like, I don't know about this guy. <laughs> um, uh, this is before I worked for Hollywood. So, um, but uh, yeah, um, yeah, when I worked there and um, the other thing was, is that there's a, found, this is my favorite found footage movie of all time is a movie called Gang Tapes that is, I think, highly recommended. I, it was, if it wasn't for other people I worked with there, I would have just said like, oh, it's just another, you know, whatever tape. It was in, our, it was in the classic library. Seek that out, Tom. Seek out that movie. Gang but tapes. I tell people, gang, gang tapes, yeah. Gang tapes. I'm gonna write it down. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, I don't want to say too much about it. That's because I, I just literally thought it was just like a, like a Master P, like ghetto hood film that was like, oh, yeah, that's fun. But to me, that was a, it's an emotional ride. Um, of a film. It's like, it's, and it was made like in the early 2000s and, and stuff like that. But it was just like one of my friend, Daryl, who was the one who was always burning all the discs for everybody. He's like, he's like, I know, man, that movie looks stupid, but trust me, this movie, it's, 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 it's real. Um, because everyone would buy Wire season four, which is the famous season of the kids. So, uh, and I'd always say, oh, what more do you have? People would say, and I'm like, gang tapes. That's the one <laughs> you want to watch. Um, so, uh, so definitely that. I can go into a whole other thing, but I wanted to talk a little bit about tapes that you might remember and what are your thoughts on it? Just a brief kind of thing to kind of wrap it up. So first off, since it's trauma, my copy of Combat Shock. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Combat Shock, um, I, I don't know, actually don't know that much about Combat Shock, but um, I know it's a trauma title. I know that it reached profitability fairly recently, believe it or not. Um, you know, I know people get that confused with Trauma's War. Um, it does, um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a strong uh, trauma title. And, uh, you, you know, it was one of those tapes where if you if you owned a video store and you were trying to fill up your shelves and uh you went to trauma to buy one of their 800 films in their catalog you you'd probably get that in with like 10 other titles and pay like one third the cost of a hollywood title um but that looks like an awesome vhs i'm very jealous it's a star maker one so uh so oh, wow. yeah it's it's like one of those uh, gold, gold good times it's like a good times quality <laughs> someone someone definitely had this on lp the whole time. Nice. Okay, what do we got here? Uh, personal favorite film of mine. One of the last films I know to be mass produced on VHS, The Salton Sea. Oh, uh, Val Kilmer. Yeah. yeah, I like that film a lot. Actually, yeah, that, that, that it, film's pretty cool. It's crazy because I don't know what happened to Tony Gaynor who wrote it. He said he wrote this as like a total like, hey, no one's ever gonna make this movie. You know, it's kind of like my Pulp Fiction, but you know, um, he wrote it like you know the whole. I wrote it on spec, but I didn't think anyone was really going to do it. And then DJ Caruso came in, who, weirdly enough, tried to be like a new Hitchcock, Brian De Palma at one point, but <laughs> this feature. So, yeah, um, highly recommend checking that out. Rewatching yeah, that. that's a very cool flick, man. Yeah, it's a good one yeah. to own, actually. Uh, personal favorite of mine, the feature I'm trying to make is highly influenced by this film. So. Oh, wow. Um, and then uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, oh, let's talk about Hitman with chuck norris <laughs> yes hitman um uh well in i mean that was one that i think blockbuster absolutely carried you know uh, blockbuster video always had a pretty strong chuck norris section so you had the missing in actions and you'd, you'd have the hitman but i think you know hitman was not quite the missing in action title as i remember it was sort of like a a good step step down not in quality or uh, but in sort of high, you know, the Chuck high got paid. no matter what, Chuck was a smart businessman. He knew, like, <laughs> he's like the one Republican that I'm like, yeah, you're all right with me. <laughs> like, you know, I, we don't see eye to eye, and there's a lot of things, but you definitely included things. Hitman is special just to this tape alone. Uh, you can't really see it gets probably washed out a little bit, but it's the Tower Records original price at $92.95. Oh, wow. It's also, uh, it's got the pre, pre rewind videotape. Uh, it also has a sticker that has the mature 17 plus only. Wow, for Hitman. Um, 
it's one of the last of the canon films actually that was mass produced uh, oh right by- okay yeah i think I, I was thinking um i was thinking of invasion usa so this was after that then right oh yeah i got a i got invasion usa on vinyl well, well after this recording i'm gonna show you <laughs> if you have time yeah um, yeah for sure um this is what no, I that's like. a that's a great one yeah I, I feel the same about chuck norris it's like yeah you get a pass you fought bruce lee you're you you know and he was the real world, world champ at that time <laughs> it's like yeah. yeah it's like you know we everyone debates on that once upon a time in hollywood it's like y'all seen way of the dragon or turn of the dragon what title you want to find it's another <laughs> great thing about exploitation films. i love alternate titles that movie yes you gotta seek it out oh that's what i wanted to get into sorry so which movie is Joe Bob talking about with Nightmare? Because is it Nightmare in a Damaged Brain that he's mentioning? Uh, he, yeah, I mean, he was talking about, uh, he referred to it only as the Nightmare from, I think, 1982. Yeah. And he mentioned it specifically as the first person nightmare in which, you know, people were getting murdered. Um, up and down the, yeah, POV, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, he was a little mysterious about it. Um, yeah, I I don't know. I mean, um, because everyone was saying like, oh, I saw that. It's called Nightmare in a Damaged Brain. Like, I don't think it was that video nasty that, that was back in the day. I think it was, I mean, this is nerd talk. I mean, at this point. No, no, no. If you, yeah, if you, uh, I'd be, yeah, I'd be curious. Like if you, if you like, yeah, it was, he was a little vague about what he was referring to, but, uh. Yeah, like nightmare cool. and a damaged brain. Yeah, sorry, I wanted to because that was the main big question. Because we were like, no, it's that one, and I'm like, yeah, it's not that one. But it, it, it's just that weird time when everything got. When there's also the anthology series with Emilio Estevez. That's like yeah, the one. Which yeah, like I mean, he said he said there there was a ton of movies named Nightmare, um, Frightmare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, Nightmare or Damaged Brain. I'll look that up though. That one looks. That yeah, like that one was definitely uh, in Britain. That was, I guess, one of the, I don't know if it's that one, but it was the whole history there was, you know, with the Britain banned all these horror tapes. Yeah. And then person actually went to jail. And I think it was, yeah, for one of the movies. But uh, one of the big controversies was that I think that Nightmare and Damage Brain had this, like, jar at a video store that was like, oh, here's the brain or something like that. And people were like, oh, is that a real brain? Because <laughs> I guess <laughs> we were gullible back then. Um, but I wanted to make a mention also of, the uh on the cover there is a three and a half stars i don't know how many <laughs> out of but um of rod lurie of los angeles magazine and rod lurie is the guy who went on to do such great films as the contender okay uh, wow. the Last castle and the, the redford okay the, the director he was a, a film critic before uh this and which kind of where his and i know he's still making features in tv i believe uh, but I really think it turned when he said, I'm going to remake Straw Dogs. <laughs> and I was like, and I think he did two things right, and then everything else is wrong. Who do yeah. you make with Straw Dogs back then? Before Alexander Sarsgaard was famous, which I think that's a perfect cast of who do you make for that character? Uh, because in that film, in the original Peck and Pop film, he's like the only good looking guy, and everyone else is all gross and grimy. So it's like, okay, <laughs> cool. I totally get that. That makes sense. Yeah um and james woods james woods is in that movie and i feel like you do that right like okay you're trying you're trying i I haven't i have have to check it out sometimes i get you know the remakes i just try to avoid all together but i yeah it's a frustrating one because it's like that and old boy spike lee's old boy are these two films i think where the directors are like no 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 like i think i can do this different and modern but also pay respect and it just is like tried you really really tried yeah there the only the yeah. only one the one i always go back to is is zach snyder's uh uh dawn of the dead i actually think like look is it gonna be better than ramiro's no it's never gonna be better than ramiro's but that was pretty good i you know so um i think james gunn wrote that one yeah it was yeah. the same weekend as scooby-doo too i remember that being like <laughs> I'm like that was the beginning where James Gunn's like I'm rich <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm rich bitch kind of moment so let's get on to um tapes here a little bit of one though this is the censored version of body of evidence ah that's Madonna right yeah 
Oh, and yes. So, that would be in the mystery suspense section, I believe, right? Yes. <laughs> um, it is the one that also, uh, I think, uh, Wondafoa is, like, covered in glass at one point. It's all that S&M. It was the S&M erotic thriller um, <laughs> kind of thing. Willem but, uh, Dafoe I, is surprisingly naked a, a lot in films. Like, far more than you think he would normally... Like, you don't look at Willem Dafoe and be like, man, that, sh that guy should do a ton of nudity. But he, uh, he, he apparently is naked in quite a few films. This copy was from Blockbuster Video originally. Ah, oh, definitely in the mystery suspense section. Ah, yeah, a lot of the, like, the... Um, it was less than softcore porn, right? It was just like oh, yeah. the most, maybe the most nudity that you could see would probably be found in mystery suspense, I think. So an interesting thing is also um, these tapes, you can't see inside as well, but uh -huh. someone wrote in when the movie actually starts. Roughly, <laughs> scribbled in there. Um, so a lot of these tapes come from, I have my own private collection, but more of the more general stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, George, uh, our producer and man behind the scenes, not Mr. Wholehead, but close enough to Mr. Wholehead. Uh, he found a lot of these at a retirement home. And he's like, Benji, do you want these? And I'm like, okay, bring them over, bring them over. There was a lot of Julia Roberts movies I had at Cypher. <laughs> yeah. He kept sleeping with the enemy. Um, <laughs> was, there a, was there a Titanic and a Jerry Maguire? <laughs> there, weirdly enough, there was no Jerry's. Uh, ah. <laughs> and, you know, I'll go into the whole Jerry world of VHS. You've probably heard about that with everything is terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's actually this card right here on our set is from when the Jerry sh uh, video store happened <laughs> yeah. uh, back when that opened up. And so, yeah, so that's the interesting thing about a lot of these tapes you'll see here is that they have scribbled in someone, some, someone wrote when the intro is. <laughs> um, something that I just, I love the art artwork for it's, it is, it is a questionable sequel karate oh, Kid three, three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think With, this is, uh, yeah. What was that guy's name? Ian Stevenson? Uh, Ian Michael Smith. Yeah. Ian, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he was uh, a good bad guy. Who yeah. was the kid? Um, I'm blanking on his name right now. We just did an episode. This is one of my favorite episodes we did for the podcast because we went into the summer of 89 with this. And the summer of 89 is full, just not just the summer, the whole year of what from Do the Right Thing to Lethal Open 2 to, it, it, the list just goes on Ghostbusters 2. Um, and, you know, and then the what one, weirdly enough, was driving this Daisy out of all that, but um, for Kevin Wards. But this poster to me is very special. I feel like this doesn't deliver officially what 3 could have done. I think 3 yeah. is an amazing setup. If you haven't rewatched 3 in a long time, I know Cobra Kai is back. But this is the one that I remember as a poster growing mm -hmm. up at BJ Videos, our local video store in Morgan Hill. Yeah, me too. I remember that, that poster is like burned into my brain. You know, that's a, that's a great poster. Yeah, so this one's special and it's, yeah, it's in the, the bonsai tree on that end. Um, getting into more of your dad's movies. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Crimson Tide, the Hans Zimmer score. Um, oh, who directed that? Uh, is that Michael Bay? No. No. It would have been Michael Bay probably a few years later. Um, why am I blanking on this? Anyway, Gene Hackman, Denzel Washington, fantastic film. R.I.P. Uh, Tony Scott. <laughs> Tony Scott. Oh. But this is yes. probably Tony's, like, it's interesting. Rewatch this because it, it's like an acid trip because all <laughs> the colors that he's using inside, it's all sweaty and tight. And then you have, like, Gondolfini like just all like raging out like Tony Soprano, early Tony Soprano. Um, yeah. And also I, I always say this is the movie that uh, reminds me of what, what times we're living in right now. We're literally like, pick a oh, side, yeah. which side are you on? And um, this, is, uh, this is definitely your dad's movies. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Although I will say oh, sorry. To Tony Scott's Man on Fire, I think is a masterpiece personally, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so we'll rush through this now. Rush. Uh, 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 um, I, oh, I didn't see that one. Who, who, what's, what do we got going on there? Oh, so uh, this is, so you see NARC, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's NARC. So this is, I always say this is the prequel to NARC because it's Jason Patrick again playing a narcotics officer undercover with Jason, Jennifer Jason Lee. This is like one of her first like non-teen movies that she did. <laughs> 
Um, great I, film. Sam Elliott's also in it. Match Perlick, if you know who he is. Bill Sadler. I'm reading the back of it now, too. Of like, Oh, I love Bill Sadler. I got to meet Bill Sadler once. He's cool. Oh, uh, by the way, how good – did you see Bill and Ted 3? Yeah, I love it. I love it. The robot is my favorite. What was his name? Uh, McCoy? <laughs> um. <laughs> it, it, it's the movie we all need right now. That's what I tell people. <laughs> um, this one always, I never seen this. I still have never watched it, but do you remember Millennium? This was always on the shelf. <laughs> oh yeah, man, that cover. Yeah, same. I've, I know that cover and I have never seen that movie. Burned into my brain though. It has Chris Christopherson in it as well. It's kind and, of like an Independence Day ripoff cover, right? Well, it's before Independence Day. This is like 1990, wow. Yeah, this is... Uh, yeah, it's, we've been expecting you <laughs> the cover of this. <laughs> but yeah, definitely Independence Day kind of, I think, maybe even maybe thought about this, but just love the art form on the back. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's the... Um, Machine fine. that if you see, like, this robot right here, very Bill and Ted. That, yeah, that looks like the robot. Uh. <laughs> so, um... And then we have uh, one of my favorite movies of all time, Lone Star. Yeah, Lone Star. Excellent. That, yep. that one that one I feel like needs to get more respect again. I think John Sales needs to come back and it, come back to us on that. Um, a classic film that was always on TV and in your video store. Oh, yeah. Wait. Unlawful Entry. Unlawful Entry, yeah. Okay. Is that... Oh, you know, I'm getting that mixed up with the one with the truck driver. Um Breakdown. I have a copy of that. But this oh, really? is Ridley Otis, the evil cop. This is like very much like Ab Cab right here. This is Ab Cab, <laughs> you know. <I'll, laughs> so, um, and then something I always remember as a kid watching a Blind like, Date. Remember, yeah, you know? excellent. Yeah, one of the last Blake Edward movies too. Kim Basinger in one of her first features as well. Yep. Um, John Larroquette. I was a huge fan of John Larroquette back in the day. I love the uh, the photo if you can see it. Um, turn down my lighting on that but um you can see uh john leonard Kett and bruce willis fighting <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like diehard style this is also a very special tape because it's one of those columbia ones that opens out and slides uh, like that. so yeah is it extra heavy too like you used to overbuild those things man um it's not one of those like clamshell ones that i think that really that that, that stuff just deteriorates so badly yeah that um i can get that one back in the box right now um just found this one Oh, oh yeah i know the cover never seen it but that cup yeah that was that would have been on the new release shelf at blockbuster for sure yeah <laughs> i just think it's two ex-lovers one open road melanie griffith patrick swayze penelope ann miller so yeah <laughs> um and then uh lahane but it just is called hate <laughs> on uh on tape Sundance Select. Uh, ah Sundance Select yeah nice. one of my all-time another all-time favorite films of mine Oh, yeah? Uh, oh, cool. First Born. First. Oh, I don't even know what that is. So is. I've never seen that. I'll read you the back of this cover. First Born takes a look at three different people who are caught all in the middle. Terry Gar stars a young divorced mother trying to balance her relationship with her son and her interest in Sam, Peter Weller, a drifter who has wandered into her life. Christopher Collette and Corey Haim play the young boys who think that they have to somehow save their mom from Sam's clutches. The plot thickens when Sam moves in and mom falls deeper in love and closer to trouble. Finally, it's up to the firstborn, Colette, to say to, um, to save the day by stepping forward to behave more like an adult than any of the adults in his life. The end result is firstborn, an intense and intriguing look at very real family problems. Rated PG-13, directed by Michael Apt. <laughs> I just, I picture Peter Weller as Robocop in that film. So he's like this abusive dad, like he's just like, hey, <laughs> like, but it's funny, firstborn, you would think, okay, we're going to put Corey Haim on the cover, right? It's not, it's the other guy, because I guess he was the firstborn, but. <laughs> oh, that's funny. But he looks yeah. like Corey Haim on this cover. It's really weird. Um, unknown film, uh, Cross of Iron, most people don't know about Sam Peck, one of Sam Peck and Paul's last oh, movie. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. Cool Sam cover. Peck. Yeah, this one's great. This also has another special cover of it's a media release, so it goes, it has a little flap on the back. But James Coburn and uh, James uh, and James Mason, uh, Maximilian Schnell as well. 
on there. But yeah, that cover is pretty amazing. I mean, very controversial film. Uh, you know, it's like you're with the Nazis on this side of the film. Oh, oh and, wow, interesting. Yeah, you're not you're not with the uh, you're not with the, yeah <laughs> yeah. It's a the film details the struggle of a hard battled German army sergeant Steiner played by James Colburn to hold his platoon together on the Russian front. So it's essentially they're it's it's all they're all gonna die. It's wages of fear, kind of thing. Like right. That. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, that's recommend. fascinating. Um, we're James almost- Coburn. James Coburn as a German. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, an added note. This is just my history because I'm obsessed with Peck and Paw stuff. Yeah. Is a bridge built too far was shooting at the same time, and they took all the tanks and all the World War II gear, and Peck and Paw had like nothing except for like one tank that didn't work. <laughs> oh wow. So, so it was like one of the histories. One of my all-time favorite films that's not available on DVD anywhere. George, yeah, okay. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that cover. Yeah, George Hung's, uh, uh, which we call it, follow-up to Swimming with Sharks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Swimming with Sharks. That's, um, uh, who was in that? Uh, Frank Wheely, right? Or no? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is like the greatest sex teen comedy of the 90s. Um, Marley Shelton is the girl of his dreams. And Jennifer uh, Love Hewitt gives the best performance I've ever seen her give where it's like, she's not like just the ghost whisperer, or some dopey girl, hot girl in, um, she's actually the side, she's the best friend who's trying to get with him, but you know, and so yeah, this movie, if you can find it, highly recommend checking it out. Uh, great film. Yeah, I, I, I should watch it. I, I've lived sort of with the cover in my head, so I should, I should see it. Well, it'll be online here so you can rewind through it. We're almost done here, so. Bad uh, Lieutenant, man. Yeah. <laughs> so I digitized a copy of this. We're going to show it where I rewind and fast forward the him dancing around naked like four or five times. And then the same part, which is uh, the part when he's jerking off. The, and I just, I kept like, re- I just had to stop and rewind it just as a joke. That's when he, pull, he pulls over the car and he's like, <laughs> your mouth, let me see your mouth. Let me see. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. That's it's crazy. And then also in the church where he's just like, oh, like his... His screaming in the church is amazing. I, I had to pick and choose. I, I felt like two scenes was great. I think if I kept doing it like over and over, because there's some, this movie is like a real film. This is not as real as it gets. Yeah, <laughs> um, man. That's like, like so. um, that is... forgotten copy of Larry Cohen's Ooh. Full Moon High. Ah, uh, yeah. the great My buddy Craig Larry actually, Cohen. is. this is his copy. I, owe, I still need to give back to him. Um, but you get uh, Adam Arkin as a werewolf and uh, Cheryl Lee from T- Walker, Texas Ranger and Matlock uh, <laughs> over there. One of, one of the forgotten uh, films. Um, who also, oh, and uh, Ed McMahon. Ed McMahon. So. Nice. <laughs> uh, one of my prized jewels, I just found out, a sealed copy, a sealed copy of Homeboy with Mickey Rourke. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. I've never seen that one, but homeboy it's man. the wrestler before the wrestler it's it's essentially how rush is before an art on that oh really uh, you think aronofsky watched that and then tapped uh rourke well what's interesting is um this is uh who directed this michael sisner i don't know his work but um it is written by eddie cook and that it was um mickey rourke's pen name huh. so it's actually written by mickey rourke that's fascinating. And um, I think that there's some influence here. Um, the name actually, uh, I think, is referred to like the Dylan song. Um, but it's, it's, it's got a lot of interesting flavor on it. I would love to, yeah, we, mm-hmm. we talk, I can talk a lot about this on another time. Um, my, one of my all-time influential movies that more people should know about, Tulane Blacktop. Never heard of it. Looks, looks awesome. Is that independent or looks? looks Monty cool. Hellman shot right after easy rider universal wanted to make three or four films for like under a million written by rudy woolitzer who did pat garrett and billy the kid and walker uh it is the only film that stars james taylor and dennis wilson huh and james taylor says he's never seen this movie because they were i I guess they were on heroin (laughs) most of it uh though they're more quiet so i think they're just stoned in general uh the girl who is her uh, Lady Bird? What is her full name? It's uh, Lori Bird, the the Drifter Girl. They, their names only go by the Mechanic and the Driver. And Warren Oates is GTO. He's the <laughs> other guy. It's a race, cross race country, a uh, race to for pink slips. But Lori Bird sadly uh, killed herself a few years after this movie, 
and then Dennis Wilson, you know, we you can go in more into Dennis Wilson with Manson and and the the tragedy of the boat accident. So so yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's an interesting one, but it's it's beautiful. It's and Harry Dean Stanton's in it. There's a I highly yeah uh, that's I love Harry Dean Stanton. Um another movie that highly influential things uh, in it. Bill Paxton, Lance Hendrickson Hendrickson and who's in the middle? Jenna Goldstein. Ah, nice. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that one. And it's got the great cover. This is actually um ties in. I always tell people it's weird. Lost Boys and this literally are the our companion pieces because Joshua Miller, who plays the other vampire, is Jason Patrick's <laughs> little brother. And they're both sons of the exorcist himself. Uh, or uh, <laughs> um what Father Kiris. <laughs> Not Father <laughs> it, uh, Pat, Jason Miller. So it's they all go hand in hand. But this this is I prefer watching it on VHS. Like the cinematography is beautiful in this movie, but the VHS just gives it such a great quality. Oh yeah, it's a different experience altogether. It's really people under the stairs, Craven's great lit latest one. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. poster. Great, um, great cover art. Uh, this is my my test copy for every VHS player I play. <laughs> Bird on a wire. Yeah. And then um. This one that I always saw at the video store, but they always have the censored version at Blockbuster. Oh, without the uh, licking of the bodily fluids? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah, great flick. Uh, yeah, I remember uh, talking about that a lot, thinking that it was pretty, I don't know, it felt, I mean, when I saw it, it felt groundbreaking at the time. Uh, I haven't seen it since, so I don't know, you know? It's very of its time. Like, it's very much mid-90s uh, MTV. But like the awesome. commentary and, and of course um, a lot of the, you know, commentary that Gregor Aki's work is on cisgenderism and bisexuality mm -hmm. and, and on top of that. And uh, just also commercialism, like the last line is Juan Dorito, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, um, and also, you know, yeah, just a probably Rose McGowan's finest work next to Planet Terror mm -hmm. is in the movie. Um, well, yeah, I, uh, I also found a film that we should all maybe watch a little more now called God's Call. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that looks um, like it. Which is, a, which is a, which I found at a Salvation Army. And yes, it uh, is a family affair. <laughs> so um, I'll end on that note. Uh, but yeah, Tom, thank you for sticking around for this hour that we did. Yeah, today. no, no problem. That was a great, that was a wonderful tour. I, uh, I wrote down several titles that I will absolutely check out. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, um, yeah, just uh, doing a little quick outro here. I'm Benji Carver here with uh, Inside the Warp Dimension, everybody. I will see you, I guess, in the Warp Dimension again very soon. And, uh, and you can also follow us at me at Kid Glove Killer and at Another Hole in the Head, IG, at Movie Hopping Twitter. And Tom, where can we find you, actually? <laughs> Uh, well, just check me out at uh, uh, VHSMasker.com or, uh, you know, um, at, on Twitter, just VHSMasker. Same thing on Instagram, same thing on Facebook. And, uh, yeah, it's been a blast. I uh, enjoyed being in the Warp Dimension and checking out your sweet VHS collection. Yeah. Uh, I have a tape here for you. This is what I keep my hard drive in. <laughs> These are great for uh, putting external hard drives in. So the clamshell does rain at, on something good. So yeah. Yeah. If you could yeah. find one in, in good condition, it, it works well. Well, cheers from the North Pole icebreaker. So, uh, uh, this is actually from the North Pole, supposedly. So, um, uh, ask my grandma. So, uh, so all right. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see you. Mr. Holds Wolf Dimension. Thank you so much for tuning in, folks. Thank you.